Thank you for the introduction, Adam. Uh, I wanted to share a few stories with you about Mount St. Helens and how it intrigued a passion in myself that I carry on through today. I have four questions for you. The first one I don't necessarily want a response, but for the other three I would like you to raise your hand if it applies to you specifically. So what shapes our landscape? Plate tectonics, volcanoes, erosion, all of those things which we can witness right here in our own town. For myself, it was watching the news in May and March of 1980 as Mount St. Helens had its first steam blast eruption. Woke up all of the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, and they showed up on the scene in droves. Mount St. Helens at the time was the most studied volcano on Earth. Uh, myself, I had uh, my aunt living in Pullman, and she sent me a small little vial of volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens. Of course, when I met with some people, they said, I can't believe they're actually selling this. We were trying to get rid of it. And the first thought that came to me was, why didn't she send me a bigger jar? <laughs> uh, myself, that really intrigued an interest in the natural sciences. And that interest continues on today for myself. And what I found so interesting about this was the dramatic change to landscape all in one fell swoop. I was studying uh, natural resource management and recreation, and my emphasis was in geology. I made an application in 1994 to the newly formed Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument to be a naturalist interpreter at Coldwater Ridge, which is now known as the Mount St. Helens Institute. With that, I was awarded the internship. I showed up to Mount St. Helens with a friend of mine, Rob, who introduced me to the program, and went through a two-week intensive study about Mount St. Helens, the volcano before, during, and after, and the ecology that takes place as far as today. So my first question is, who went to Mount St. Helens prior to the eruption? in the audience today. A few of us, okay? It was a very popular destination for fishing and hunting. The YMCA had a camp on the shores of, of Spirit Lake. One of the more infamous characters of that time was Harry Truman. You may remember Harry Truman. He was an old guy. Uh, he had invested his whole life, about 50 years of his life, into his lodge at Harmony Falls, and one might think that he was the first person to think of choosing his own death, in essence, death with dignity, the rules, that, the law that we have in Washington State today. His quote, this mountain is a part of me and I am a part of it. Those words are no more different today than they were 25 years ago because he is still there today. So this first shot here is prior to the eruption. The individual in the front is David Johnston. He was working for the USGS in Vancouver, Washington, monitoring the, erupt the volcano prior to the eruption. He's looking through a device here that allows him to gauge the distance from himself to that rather large bulge on the north side of the volcano. That bulge really didn't trigger too many concerns with the geological survey because nobody had ever witnessed something like this. We all were sitting around the TV in March watching the first broadcast of a volcanic eruption in history. He witnessed it firsthand. There was a little reflector up on that mountain that was measuring the speed at which that bulge was exceeding towards the north. And that was moving at about five feet a day. Today we would look at something similar to that and it's like, okay, let's hang out on the south side of the mountain, right? <laughs> well, David Johnston was very interested in seeing exactly what was going to take place. And he was on a rotation with two or three other geologists and volcanologists at the time, seeing what was going to happen with the volcano. 
So my next question, who lived in Yakima or Washington at the time of the eruption, May 18th, 1980? Almost most of us. So your memories are going to be a little, lot different than mine, although we were probably all sitting in front of the same news channel. But you had to sweep off your roofs. You had to shovel all that ash into the storm drains. Most all of that ash ended up in Chesterly Park, where they dumped it uh, to get it out of the streets. The city was not totally, but it was virtually shut down for a week. And it was at least two weeks before they cleared the roads. And you could actually drive down the roads without special air filters on your car so that they didn't seize up your motors. There were seven in, in really eight different stages of the eruption. And I want to kind of go over some of those quickly. And then we'll come back and kind of identify with what affected this region the most. So in March, as I indicated, there was a steam blast eruption. Basically, magma was moving into the magma chamber. It hit some water. Poof, a little steam comes out the top of the mountain. From that point until May 18th, 1980, this is prior to the, the main eruption of the seven parts I want to talk about, were what was now known, which now is known as harmonic tremors. It was constant earthquake. And that constant earthquake, as we know, earthquakes is earth moving. There was magma that was filling up the, lava, the, the magma chamber underneath the volcano itself. And that first steam blast actually repressed that pressure that was being emitted from the magma chamber, creating that bulge that we just saw a minute ago. With um, this, the first stage of the May 18th eruption, what we saw was initially a 5.1 earthquake. An earthquake which led to a landslide. A landslide which led to a, an exorbitant blast. After the landslide, there was an ash plume, a pyroclastic flow, and then mud flows, or lahars, that came down mainly on the north side of the mountain uh, through the Tootle River. The earthquake was a 5.1 on the Richter scale, something you would definitely feel. It would wake you up out of bed. It would knock wine off shelves. That earthquake then triggered the landslide, which you can see in this second image here, just starting. The third image, you can see the lateral blast. The lateral blast blew down... 850 million board feet of timber. It cost Mount Saint, uh, it cost Weyerhaeuser approximately $400 million in lost revenue due to timber. The ash plume, which is just starting to be seen here, is what affected most of this region the most. That was the deposit of ash. There was about an inch of ash that dropped in Yakima itself. And it actually was measurable for 22,000 square miles to the east of here. Measurable deposits of ash. The plume rose approximately 17 miles into the atmosphere and was most clearly the most significant portion that affected this side of the mountain. The pyroclastic flow, so those four sections was approximately seven minutes of the eruption. Proceed after that were the pyroclastic flows. And if you've ever done any skin exfoliation or things along those lines, you've used pumice stone, which is what's used for that. It's a very, very lightweight, gas-infused rock, in essence, that was heated and cooled exceedingly quickly. And on the front side of the mountain, about here, is what they refer to as the pyroclastic flow area. And this, you would assume, would be completely denuded for all time, because it really cannot maintain any soil. But when I was up there three days ago, that area is completely vegetated. The Lahars, which was in the most impact on the west side, created mainly from the immediate 
flashing of steam and water of the water table in the mountain, the glaciers, and the snow melt, all of which took place for the most part instantaneously, started to flow down the Toodle River, increased the elevation of Spirit Lake by in excess of 200 feet, and in the Toodle River Valley, which is about 17 miles long, the average depth is 150 feet. It continued to proceed through Kelso and Longview and went into the Columbia River Gorge. In the Columbia River, as you know, there's a lot of navigational activity with ships. It closed all shipping for two days. It was two weeks prior, or two weeks until they actually dredged it in enough to make normal navigation take place in that region. It filled the Columbia River from 40 feet to 14, just with debris. And this is, what, 50 miles from the volcano? And it just filled the Columbia River. So those were the main portions. Last thing about the Lahars, and you saw that on the news, right? So the Lahars was the large land mass that just moved down the Tootle River Valley. And the reason I call it a land mass, in essence, is because it was only 30% water. The rest was trees, vegetation, debris from the mountain itself. And as it went through the Tootle River Valley, it actually deposited things that they now know as hummocks. And many of these terms, harmonic tremors, hummocks, were all written down, defined in essence, during the eruption or after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in the research that they had done. The eighth portion of this eruption, which I'm going to refer to as the lava dome building eruptions, many people have asked me, oh, well, what's happened since? Between 1980 and 1991, there were 17 what they referred to as lava dome building eruptions. And these were small magmatic intrusions onto the valley floor, uh, the crater floor, and it increased. It created this, this lava dome, they referred to it as Muffy, at 1,000 feet. In the future, that will be the summit of Mount St. Helens. And Mount St. Helens will look, again, like a normal cone type of volcano, similar to Adams, as that lava dome continues to build. There were more lava dome building eruptions that were more steam blast and ash blast generated uh, in 2004 and all the way up until 2008. And since then, it has not been that much activity. At present, Mount St. Helens is not classified as the most active volcano in the, in the world, but it is most certainly the most active in the Cascades. It erupts approximately every 125 years. So who's been to Mount St. Helens since the eruption? Quite a few of you. Great. So. Not everybody's aware, but there were several people that lived along the Toodle River. They had cabins or they went up to visit there. They refused to return. I met somebody's daughter um, who lost a house uh, on the Toodle River, and, and she said her, her family refuses to go back up there because the memories are so stark of how it used to be. And today they would say, oh, it's been destroyed, in essence. I don't think it's been destroyed. I just think it's been rejuvenated. It's been changed. The landscape has changed. So there's three major areas to visit. The first area is on the east side. It's about two and a half to three hours from here. Uh, these are areas that Spirit Lake is accessible from these areas. The miner's car, there was actually a miner up there at the time of the eruption, and his car is still sitting there in Oldsmobile. <laughs> Spirit Lake, like I said, you can hike to the Spirit Lake where that location is. And then Windy Ridge, which is an interpretive site. They have an open amphitheater. I do suggest, uh, prior to doing the two and a half to three hour drive, to check out volcanocam.com. It's a live feed of the volcano. Uh, we went up, we didn't have an opportunity to see the mountain, but we did find other things to, to check out and show my nieces and nephews. On the south side, so as you go from here, you would uh, drive to Randall and take a left on 25, which would go towards Cougar. And then Cougar is on the, the south side of the mountain. The south side was virtually unaffected by the eruption. There were some small lahars on the south side, but generally the really interesting parts of that side of the volcano is the Ape Caves, which is a lava tube generated about 5,000 years ago with a lava flow 
more similar to the type of lava flow that you might expect to see in Hawaii, where the lava flew over the, the, the topography and then it sank into the soil and actually created lava tubes. So you can enter these lava tubes, hike a, a mile and a half, and then come out to the other side. Very interesting effects in there as it relates to the hot lava traveling through a tube and making it deeper and deeper and deeper and then maybe there's a hard rock and it gets very shallow and up and down and up and down. It's a very interesting topography underneath the ground. The other very interesting place on the south side is the Trail of Two Forests. And during that same lava flow, there was a forest there at the time where when the lava flow came through, there were trees. It burned out those trees, but it cooled the lava in a matter of time that allows those holes to still be there. So you can see where dead trees used to stand during the time of this eruption. As well, some trees fell over. If you want, you can get into the bottom, hike up, hike, actually crawl up, and then through another exit and be inside of a tree, in essence, that cooled the lava around it during that eruption. And then there's the, the north side. The north side is where I worked, Highway 504, off of, out of Kelso Longview. There's uh, about five different visitor centers. There's the Silver Lake. Well, it, at the exit, there's an IMAX theater, which is well worth seeing. And then there's the Silver Lake visitor centers run by the state of Washington. And then there's a Weyerhaeuser site, which is very interesting. Talks a lot about what Weyerhaeuser lost and, and, and those effects. And then there's, at the very top of the road, Johnston's Ridge, which is named after David Johnston. Um, this picture here is taken from Johnston's Ridge. And you can see now that lava dome that I was mentioning earlier. Here's the Toodle River that's flowing down now. And then if you look carefully, it's hard to see, but in these areas here, here, and even here, previous eruptions, those are the hummocks. So very large portions of the volcano itself during the eruption rolled down to, you know, as one piece and created the hummock field, which is just a bunch of little mounds that are very distinctive looking. Um, I worked at uh, Coldwater Ridge, which was the newest office at the time. And Coldwater Ridge now is known as the Mount St. Helens Institute where you can take classes, you can take school classes there to do presentations or have presentations done. They also have job postings. So if that's something that you might be interested in. I want to thank you for your time and listening to me talk about Mount St. Helens and my few fashions. And thank you very much. You have a nice evening.